This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 744, recorded on April 15th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. This is clinical update number 58. Have things gotten better since last week, Daniel? Um, I'm not going to say that they have. And I will start <laughs> off with a quotation that is in line with that. Um, when things are going well, something will go wrong. When things just can't get any worse, they will. <laughs> Anytime things appear to be going better, you have overlooked something. Wow. Uh, and that is the immortal words of Richard Feynman. Excellent. That's perfect for this week, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, he actually, I, I don't know if people have a chance to, to read, but uh, he's written a few books. Uh, one of them, Surely You Must Be Joking, um, is one of my favorites. Uh, but yeah, so uh, yes, this has been a very tough week. So never miss an opportunity to vaccinate, never miss an opportunity to test, never waste a vaccine dose. Um, so let, let me give, let me start off with my update. We've got a lot of stuff that happened this last week, so we have a lot to cover. Um, <clears throat> but this week there was some attention given to Lost on the Frontline, um, which has been a 12-month investigation by uh, The Guardian, Cage, and to track uh, healthcare worker deaths uh, during the pandemic. Um, and I found that reading the article, um, this was titled, 12 Months of Trauma, More Than 3,600 U.S. Health Workers Died in COVID's First Year. Um, was, it was a very emotional experience for me to, to read this through. Um, you know, I focus on the science, what we can learn from this experience, what we have learned about um, how to treat this horrible disease. But, you know, all the work we still need to do um, and I think to take stock of what we've really been through is 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 upsetting. Um, you know, as I, I recount, you know, thousands of healthcare workers that have died over the last year. Um, you know, many many you know, these are my colleagues. Uh, many of these individuals I've uh, I've known, trained with. Um, there were some key findings uh, that were here in this publication, um, and just to just a few of them. Um, one. <clears throat> more than half of those who died were younger than 60. Um, and I, I think um, that that is something. Um, you know, the general population, the median age of people who who died from COVID um, is in the 70s. Um, but in the healthcare worker population, it was younger. Um, the other nurses and support staff die, died in far higher numbers than physicians. So um, there's an equity issue here where the physicians were either uh, better able to or better helped um, uh, to keep themselves safe. Um, you know, as I think a lot of people know, if they've ever been in the hospital, ever interacted with healthcare, it's it's the nurses, it's the assistants, it's the aides um, who are really, really in their hands-on. Um, and um, one of the other twice as many workers, healthcare workers died in nursing homes as in the hospitals. Um, and uh, th this is something um, particularly sort of sensitive issue for me um, because of all the controversies about the nursing homes and the fact that um, a lot of those workers were, I have to say, blamed. You know, say, oh, those hardworking health workers brought it into the nursing homes. It it's really tragic just how many of my colleagues have died through the last year. Um, the last week I was talking with one of my partners, Anuja Lee, who is now the Associate Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease for Health, Pro Health New York, um, just about how fondly I remember all the support and recognition we received from our communities during these difficult times. You know, the free food, the evening vigils, the placards, some of those are still up. Um, just, just let everyone know, this has really uh, meant a tremendous amount. Um, things continue to be tough, but um, I have to say all the support um, has really meant something. So thank you. Um, in addition uh, to all my colleagues that died directly from COVID, I suspect many of our listeners are aware of how many, uh, well, more than one of my colleagues, um, you know, you may even know sort of in local community circles here, um, just found this whole tragedy too much and actually took their own lives during these dark times. So um, 
you know, this continues to be uh, a difficult time. We are on a plateau with far too many people getting infected, far too many people dying. Here in the U.S., we're on a plateau. Um, but when we look beyond our borders and we don't have to look very far, we can see those numbers. We're now seeing counted over 5 million new cases a week um, and the death toll just keeps climbing. So we are, we are nowhere near mission accomplished here. Um, all right. Um, on that happy note, children and COVID and masks, I'm going to throw in here. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps I'll be remembered for a few things, um, you know, after this settles down. Um, you know, one of them trying to point out early on um, the tragedy of long COVID and not to dismiss these individuals that this was real. Um, but I think the other um, is for repeatedly uh, my attempts to point out that children I believe are at lower risk, but they're not at no risk. So there was a research letter that was uh, published in JAMA, Characteristics and Disease Severity of U.S. Children and Adolescents Diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, now, the authors here were affiliated with the COVID-19 response team at the CDC, um, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Laboratory Sciences, um, also at the CDC, and the commissioned core U.S. Public Health Service in Rockland, uh, Maryland. Um, and a couple things that this um, article pointed out. Uh, one was that um, more than 2 million pediatric COVID-19 cases were reported in the United States, um, you know, in 2020. Um, and they say, although approximately half of pediatric patients with COVID-19 experience mild disease, some children require admission to intensive care units or require the use of invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, and what they did here is they conducted a cohort study to try to estimate uh, adjusted associations between demographic, clinical characteristics, and severe COVID-19 among hospitalized pediatric patients. Um, so we just go through a little bit of what they present to us, but I'm going to give the caveats as well. So they, they evaluated a cohort of 20,714 pediatric patients with COVID-19, um, pretty evenly split, about 52.9% were, were girls, um, the other half um, males, right? So we have sort of a split here. Um, they reported that of these individuals, 11.7% were hospitalized, and of those hospitalized, um, about a third had severe COVID um, with management in the ICU. Um, so a lot of caveats here. Um, I think that we can say um, a couple things from the study. One, and this seems consistent with the experience shared um, among my pediatric colleagues, is that if a person under the age of 18 ends up in the hospital, um, as we saw this COVID, cohort, a quarter to a third of them will be taken care of in the ICU. Um, one of the things the authors even said is it, not, it isn't even necessarily um, the same level of severity. We might see an adult that prompts that, um, but we sort of have a heightened level of concern for our um, younger um, individuals. Um, one of the things that is tough, I don't think we really have a good sense, and I've touched on this before, about how many kids with COVID actually go undiagnosed. Um, you know, we never find all the asymptomatic kids, and we certainly never find the untested symptomatic kids. Um, so I don't think we have a true denominator here. So uh, the one thing I'm going to say, and I, I, just, I like to be honest on this, when I see, oh, 11.7% of kids that get COVID end up in the hospital, I don't think that really is consistent with our experience. Um, I think 11.7% of this cohort ended up in the hospital. That is true. Um, but I'm not sure this is uh, representative of the entire pediatric cohort. Um, I think if that was actually happening, our um, pediatric hospitals would would not be as quiet as they were during, during the pandemic to date. Um, that may be different in different countries. Some positive news on the vaccine front. Don't worry, I'll get to the negative. Um, Pfizer BioNTech did announce that they are requesting expansion of their EUA to include individuals aged 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, and I discussed um, a week ago when we recorded the last TWIV that this was sort of impending. And once that was announced, uh, the clock would start with a minimum of 15 days from the announcement. Um, so we're we're moving into that. So we're we're hoping that in May we're going to see Pfizer um, expanded down to um, age 12. 
Um, also, chill, still in the children in COVID, um, I've been getting a lot of communications um, about this. Um, I think many people are comfortable with the idea that schools can be safely open, um, but I'm getting a lot of questions about something I brought up on the last TWIV. Um, and this is this seeming disconnect between um, it's safe for the kids to sit three feet apart with masks on, um, and at the same point, the CDC considering um, being within um, less than six feet, so at three feet, um, regardless um, of masks being an exposure. So wh where, where are we with what are the updated as of March 21st, 2021 CDC public health guidance for community related exposure definitions and guidance? So um, as per the CDC, individuals who have had close contact within six feet for a total of 15 minutes or more exposed to, I'm going to pause there for a second, right? So the CDC is still using that 15 minutes. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of times you see the, the 10 minutes thrown out there, but um, sort of scouring through the CDC websites, 15 minutes seems to be what um, the CDC is still, still putting out there. Um, exposed to, to whom? Um, to a person with COVID-19 who either has symptoms or uh, in the period two days before symptom onset until they meet the criteria for discontinuing um, isolation, right? So um, that is either 10 days or there's the test out um, ending isolation option. Um, or the other is a person who has tested positive for COVID-19, um, but has not had any symptoms. So again, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to use that as your start date and the exposure is anytime two days prior to that positive test or until they meet the criteria for ending the isolation. So, so the two issues here, the first one I pointed out, 10 minutes versus 15 minutes. The CDC is still using the, um, the 15 minutes. Um, but then there was a note, there's a note sort of right below this, and it says, note, this exposure, this is irrespective of whether the person with COVID-19 or the contact was wearing a mask or whether the contact was wearing respiratory personal protective equipment, PPA. So wait, do masks work? We were just told, right, that three feet of distance with everyone wearing masks in schools is minimal risk. Um, so here comes down to the issue is, is should the CDC update, update guidance for what is considered a school exposure? Um, and what ends up triggering quarantine. I will say one of the schools in our area, not right here in Port Washington, but one of our local schools um, has been in contact with the um, local community of health, local department of health, um, and they've actually sort of updated their local guidance and said, no, if we're gonna allow these schools to open under these circumstances, if everyone's wearing masks, three feet apart with enforced mask wearing, um, if that's really being held to, we're not consider that, can consider that a trigger for quarantine. Um, so I, I think this is this is an this is an important issue. Um, you know, if being three feet apart, um, you know, less than six feet, wearing masks indoors um, at a school should count as an exposure. Um, this is actually an interesting issue because for healthcare workers, we actually have uh, slightly different rules, right? For healthcare workers, there's the idea that we know how to properly wear masks. Um, and there is some concern that, you know, at least per the CDC up till now, um, that people don't really um, either know how to wear a mask properly or the masks that, that they are wearing are not proper masks. So I understand the concern, right, that people don't wear their masks properly and the masks are of different quality. But I, I do want to point out, um, you know, Dr. Fauci, we all see him on TV. We see our president. They're not wearing medical masks. They're wearing cloth masks. Um, so I think it's critical um, for messaging that we get on the same page um, with regard to are masks effective or not. Um, but maybe we haven't been doing enough education about how to wear those masks properly. So I'm actually going to take a moment here. This will be my public service announcement on how do you wear your mask properly. And I'm basically going to be um, sharing helpful CDC advice on how to improve how your mask protects you and others. Um, so I'm gonna hit eight points here. So one, make sure your mask fits snugly across your face. You should be breathing through your mask and not around it. And 
please cover your nose. In my mind, if your nose is sticking out, you are not actually wearing a mask. And I have a couple, you know, for those people watching, I have a couple masks here to demonstrate. So I'm going to demonstrate that now. If you're listening, I'll describe it for you. I'm going to put a mask on that will fit snugly against my face. And I think people who are watching can see. This is actually, I want to thank one of our listeners who I believe this is handmade in Thailand. It's not important that your mask is completely symmetrical, right? <laughs> it's just important, right? <laughs> I always get in trouble with that, trying to get my mask symmetrical. Um, but it has to fit. You want to use a nose piece if you can. So that's number number three. So choose a mask with layers. I'm going to take this off now. You don't want to have just one thin piece of fabric. You want to have layers. Also, some of these will actually have the ability to put a filter in there. Three, choose a mask with a nose wire to improve the fit and bend that wire over your nose to fit close to your face. Um, four, check your mask to make sure you feel warm air coming through the mask, not out the sides, the top, or the bottom. Five, if you have facial hair, we're not sure how effective masks are. So, Trim that beard if you can. Consider double masking. Uh, consider shaving. Um, six, do not pull your mask down or out of the way to speak. And I, I want to use that as an example. Again, you'll get to see, I saw this and I see this all the time. People put their mask on and then they want to speak. So they either pull it away from their <laughs> mouth or they pull it down to speak. I think uh, we may have witnessed one of our elected officials. He needed to cough or sneeze. He pulled off his mask, coughed into his hands, sneezed into his hands. I'm not sure where he wiped them. Um, but you do not take the mask off to cough or sneeze or talk. You want to have it on specifically at those times. Um, <clears throat> also, don't take it off to yell at the athletes. That's another one I see. Um, also, teachers, you do not take it off to have your students better understand what you have to tell them. Seven, do not wear masks with one-way valves. They only protect you and not others. You are sending a very negative message. Um, eight, do wash your hands immediately after removing a mask. Remember, this is supposed to protect you. So if it's actually protected you, it is now potentially dirty. So take it off by the loops. Um, and then try to avoid contaminating your hands. We also have some do nots from the CDC. Um, do not wear two disposable masks at the same time. So if you're wearing those, um, those blown masks, which are that charged fiber, um, these have been studied one mask at a time, not two. And this also applies to the issue of KN95 or N95s. Um, we are currently recommending not to cover those with a surgical mask. I have to say for my medical colleagues, we got quite used to the fact that we were using surgical masks to protect and preserve our N95. So uh, I know some of my colleagues still feel a little bit odd about that. So all right, the pre-exposure period. Um, on April 13th, we saw the article, physical inactivity is associated with a higher risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes, a study in 48,440 adult patients. Um, and this was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, this might be a surprise, um, you know, that... Uh, exercising might have some health benefits, um, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Um, and what did, what did these individuals find? Um, they found for, for those individuals who were consistently inactive, that they had a greater risk of hospitalization. So these are individuals diagnosed with COVID-19 who were consistently inactive. Um, their odds ratio of hospitalization was 2.26. Their admission to the ICU was 1.73, increased odds ratio, and their chance of death was 2.49, so almost twice as likely to die um, you know, if they were diagnosed with COVID-19, ended up in the hospital. Um, so basically, people who are consistently inactive um, have a higher risk, at least per this study. Um, so, you know, out on a limb, perhaps people should exercise. One more reason, um, you know, now we need a randomized control trial where half the people exercise and the other half serves as the control to really determine
determining uh, if exercise is a good thing. Um, but I'm a little worried if we do this as a blind study, are people going to, you know, end up hurting themselves? So um, somehow we have to have people exercising, not exercising, not aware of which group they're in and not wearing blindfolds. Um, <laughs> um, testing. Um, I, I think we're seeing an interesting pattern here in our primary care and urgent cares where people are post-vaccination and they have what seems like um, mild symptoms after a good COVID exposure, but yet they're, they're antigen uh, test negative. So um, we may be seeing some, some of that sort of, um, you know, effect of the vaccine um, sort of below the radar of even getting um, positive testing. So um, more, when we have more information, I'll, I'll make sure I share that. Active vaccination. Everyone's probably waiting for this. Um, I expect all our listeners are familiar with the J&J &J vaccine pause here in the U.S. Um, and let me just give everyone an update. I had the opportunity to be on the call today uh, where we got a rundown on what we know to date. So this is, this is you know, hot off the press. Um, so there were six reports to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System between March 19th and April 12th of women between the ages of 18 and 48 having a rare clotting complication. Um, so these individuals had cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, this is a clotting of the vein complex inside your brain, sort of, you know, think about it, you're a few inches behind your eyeballs there. Um, and they had platelet counts less than 150,000 um, per millimeter uh, cubed. I do want to point out by comparison, we have seen zero reports of this cavernous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. Um, in the 182 million doses of mRNA vaccines given in the United States. So um, I know there's a little bit of, oh, this is just something, um, but no, this looks like it is not a problem with the mRNA vaccine. So I wanna make that really clear. Onset um, for these individuals, it was six to 13 days after vaccination. Um, so this sort of follows the timing. That's when we start to see um, the IgG or the immunoglobulins start to come up, not necessarily just IgG. Um, they were all um, Caucasian females. Um, three out of the six were three out of the six were obese, so half were obese, half were not. Um, there were no known coagulation disorders in this group of six women. Um, Initially, a headache was reported in five of the six. Um, the last person um, did not have a headache initially, but a headache um, soon developed. Their initial presentation was back pain. Um, now, half of the patients um, had clotting in other areas. Um, so lower extremities, the portal vein, um, pulmonary artery, um, and they were able to, and this is going to be relevant as we go forward, they're able to test for something, an antibody against platelet factor four. And of the five that they were able to test, all of these antibody tests were positive. One individual died. Uh, two of them recovered and were discharged from the hospital. Um, at the time of the report that I got today, um, half of them were still in the hospital. A uh, couple of conclusions. Um, the rate of this um, CVST does appear to be higher than would be expected for this observation period and in this particular demographic. Um, I will also point out um, that in the phase three trial, there was a 25-year-old man um, who also developed CVST, um, and he also had positive anti-PF4 antibodies. Um, we still have a significant number of individuals that were just recently vaccinated. Um, and so they haven't passed through this, um, say, six to 13 days after vaccination. Um, so we won't reach that until April 25th. Um, and at that point, we'll have a, we'll have a true number on what is, the, um, what is the number of these events that are happening after vaccination. There's a lot of speculation. I think there's growing evidence that this may be a similar phenomenon to what we um, are seeing as a rare issue with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there were a couple publications in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that shed some light on what might be happening there. And by comparison, I'll, I'll try to uh, get a connection here. So the original article, thrombotic thrombocytopenia after Chadox one um, and COVID-19 vaccination was published. Um, and the authors report that of the 11 original patients, nine were women, um, median age of 36 and a range of 22 to 49 years of age. Beginning five to 16 days after vaccination, the patients presented with one 
or more thrombotic events, uh, with the one uh, exception of one patient who actually presented with a fatal intracranial hemorrhage. Um, of the patients with one or more thrombotic events, nine had cerebral venous thrombosis, three had splanchnic vein thrombosis, three had pulmonary embolism, four had other thromboses, and of these patients, six died, five patients had disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, now, the authors used a standard um, ELISA to detect these platelet-activating antibodies um, against PF4 um, and a modified PF4 enhanced platelet activation test to detect platelet activating antibodies under various uh, reaction conditions. Um, included in this testing were samples from patients who had blood um, samples referred for investigation of these vaccine-associated thrombotic events um, with 28 testing positive um, on a screen. And so the authors suggest that we um, refer to this as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, so VIT, V-I-T-T. Um, same edition, there was a brief report, very similar name, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after CHADOX-1, and COVID-19 vaccination, um, and they really came to the, the same conclusion. So, so what, what is going on here? What is this PF4? Um, so PF4 is platelet factor 4, or also known as chemokine CXCL4. Um, it's a protein that's found in the alpha granules of platelets, um, and it's involved in the clotting cascade. So um, we see a very similar phenomenon rarely with a medicine we use called heparin. So it's very similar. You may have heard the term HIT or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, and, and what we're seeing here is, is really a consumption um, of our platelets followed by, well, bleeding in one instance, but in most cases, um, clotting. Um, and we, we do feel, you know, I have to say, um, there is a smoking gun here. It looks like there is a connection. Um, it looks, and we will see the true numbers right now, we're talking about one in a million. Um, AstraZeneca is about one in 600,000. So um, as we go forward, we'll have to see um, what the numbers are. Now, does it make sense for, for them to have paused from a scientific point of view? Yes. Um, if we are able to pause for another week or so, um, we will actually have that 13 days after the last J&J &J was given in the US. We'll be able to see if there's any more of these events. Um, and then we can revisit this. And on the call today, um, they actually talked about several options here. One was to just put this in context and say, okay, the rate is, let's say, one five hundred thousand, whatever they want to say. There may be the ability to say this is isolated to individuals under the age of 50. This may be isolated to women. So there may, may be discussions about um, what do we do with the vaccine relative to restricting or targeting certain populations. So um, I think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's also reassuring to see what a robust um, adverse event reporting system we had. I know, I think we had an email where someone asked like, you know, how many people need to die before we'll find out about it? I think the answer, as I said, was one, and that's what it was here. Um, we, we had a connection here. One person has died in the entire country. Um, and this has been stopped until we clarify the issue. Now, uh, people are a little concerned. We're in the middle of a pandemic here. Uh, are we stopping our vaccination efforts? So I want to give some reassurance to our listeners. Um, if you look at the number of vaccines that have been given so far, um, this makes up a small part of the number of vaccines. Um, as I mentioned, we have given almost 200 million doses of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. We have given less than 7 million of the um, J and J vaccine, um, and going forward, if anything, we have a, a vaccine glut. Uh, we're actually getting sort of looks from around the world. What are you doing with all those vaccines? <clears throat> we expect that we will have the ability by May 31st to have enough vaccines to fully vaccinate 260 million Americans, even without J and J being an option. So, um, this was something that we could really do. Um, without making any huge sacrifice or impact on our ongoing, um, really robust vaccination efforts. So um, as we learn more, and I think by next week, we might have a little more information, the following week, we should have all the information and know where we're headed with this um, this challenge. Passive vaccination. Um, we actually have some good news here. Um, we are really moving forward um, with monoclonal cocktails. And as, um, well, as of about a week ago, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, um, is now recommending um, that uh, 
monoclonals are part um, of the treatments. They are now part of the NIH's COVID-19 treatment guidelines. Um, and so they are saying for mild to moderate COVID-19 um, who are at risk of worsening disease, they should be treated with monoclonal anti antibody cocktail. So that's a pretty strong statement. <clears throat> so um, I, I feel bad. I feel like we fall down on the job here sometimes. Um, you know, I have a couple couple instances this happened. I have a gentleman right now in the ICU who will probably die. And the situation here, he and his wife um, were diagnosed. They were offered monoclonals, maybe not as persuasively as, as should have been. The wife said, certainly, Two days later, she was fine, symptoms resolved. Um, the husband is now in the ICU on a ventilator, week three, I don't think he's gonna make it. Um, and that's the second of those stories in just a few weeks here that I've experienced where two a married couple are offered therapy, the wife, maybe women are smarter than men, just throwing that out there, um, say yes, the men decide they're gonna just see how it goes. Um, uh, it doesn't always go well, so. Okay, so what are the news? We've got a few more phase three trial results. Phase three treatment trial in recently infected asymptomatic patients showed Regeneron COVID, and this is casivribumab with imdevimab, significantly reduced progression to symptomatic COVID-19. <clears throat> so this was another phase three trial. Um, it enrolled 204 individuals with any COVID-19 symptoms who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, um, but did not have antibodies at baseline. And so they were randomized to either receive the Regeneron cocktail or placebo, and they reported that they reduced the overall risk of progression by 31% with a p-value of 0.038. <clears throat> they also go on to report that the total number of weeks that patients experienced symptoms was decreased by 45%. Um, with the cocktail, and the viral burden was reduced by more than 90%. Um, so while not included in the initial analysis plan, they also found that zero of the patients that got um, the cocktail compared to six placebo patients ended up in the hospital or visited the ER during this 29-day efficacy assessment period. Um, and from a safety standpoint, there were no, no issues. Um, we also have a phase three prevention trial. <clears throat> and I think this is huge. Um, there was an article uh, recently looking at people with immune compromise, saying, what about these people? What they can't actually respond well to a vaccine. Is there any way to passively protect them from the virus? And so there was a phase three prevention trial showing 81% reduced risk of asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infections with subcutaneous administration of the Regeneron um, cocktail. Uh, so this prevention trial was a double-blind, placebo-controlled um, trial assessing the effect of the Regeneron cocktail on uninfected individuals without SARS-CoV-2 antibodies or any symptoms who lived in the same household as an individual who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 within a period of four days prior to enrollment. So they enrolled 1,505 individuals, um, <clears throat> pretty much split one-to-one, -one, uh, getting the cocktail versus placebo, um, and then they followed them out. And remember, this is a subcutaneous injection. This doesn't have to be IV. It's another way of improving access. They reported 72% protection against symptomatic infections in the first week and 93% in subsequent weeks, um, p-values with about three zeros each after the decimal. Um, they also reported, and I think this is important, an impact on severity of disease. For, so for those who did go on to get infected, on average, the individuals who were treated with the cocktails um, experienced a symptomatic infection um, and their, their symptoms resolved in about a week compared to the placebo group who were sick on average for three weeks. Um, the infected individuals also cleared the virus faster. So there was a significant reduction in the days with a high, high viral load by 90%. Um, and again, from a safety point of view, there were no concerns here. Um, so <clears throat> what's the future with monoclonals? Um, a couple things to say here. Is there really this invariant region and we can just target that if the spike could be set forever? Can we make this perfect monoclonal and just sit on our laurels? Um, I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that there is a part of the spike protein that does not vary. 
um, I was emailing with David Ho today, who does not believe that there's actually a part of the spike that, you know, cannot, will not change. Um, so I think that this is going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, and I've been reaching out and communicating with my colleagues at United Health Group about how important it is that we have regional guidance, regional access to the monoclonal cocktails, the monoclonal therapies that work the best in a given region based upon which variants are circulating um, and what resistance patterns they might have to the different monoclonal. So um, <clears throat> what's the best thing we can do to uh, stay ahead of the virus? It's to reduce the opportunity of the virus to replicate and change, uh, which means mitigation means vaccination. Period of detectable viral replication, right? This is when that person comes in positive. Just a little touch on here, because um, I'm going to close with some discussion of anticoagulation. Um, at this point in time, um, we're, we're basically saying we have no compelling evidence that uh, starting people on aspirin, starting people on anticoagulants is helpful. The first week of illness is the time for monitoring and monoclonals. Um, if they have a specific high-risk feature, then of course, always use your judgment and the latest clinical data to um, recommend for your patients. The early inflammatory phase, remember that 94% um, is what we're worried about. So ideally, we've got a lot of pulse oxes out there in the community. Remember, steroids are not during the first week. It's during that second week if needed. Um, and I am going to comment here. Where are we with anticoagulation? Should they end up in the hospital? Um, we are universally rec recommending anticoagulation. And I'm going to skip here to the tail end because we're running long and I apologize. Um, but I just wanted to vi revisit the post-discharge anticoagulation guidelines because they have evolved over time. Um, and currently, as per the NIH treatment guidelines, prophylaxis after hospital discharge, discharge is not recommended for patients with COVID-19. Um, there's currently no ASH guidelines addressing this issue. There, there will be. We're working on them. Um, but I think the consensus has been, as we look at the data, this population is not necessarily at a higher risk of post-discharge clotting complications than your general medical patient. So you use the same post-discharge anticoagulation um, guidance you normally would. Person has cancer, person has a clotting propensity, person has another indication, go ahead, use anticoagulation. But if they just came in the hospital for their five days of remdesivir, uh, for their 10 days of steroids, um, it may be that um, offering anticoagulation, the DOAX, the Eliquis, uh, the Xarelto that may be doing uh, more harm than good. So, all right, I will conclude there. And again, I want to thank everyone. We're just a couple weeks here left in our American Society of Tropical Medicine uh, fundraiser. So take a deep breath, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click that donate button um, because we are going to, I'm going to say we're hoping, I see we are going to um, support the American Society of Tropical Medicine um, in creating three um, annual meeting travel awards uh, to bring um, early career women from economically challenged parts of the world to the annual meeting this fall. Uh, really help do something to um, push their career forward and undo and address a lot of the inequities that are here. So thank you very much again. Time for a couple of questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. The first is from Jay. My daughter has celiac disease, irritable bowel, lactose intolerance, and has migraines. We were so happy when she managed to get the J&J &J vaccine. She suffered only mild chills. About to switch birth control for one that has no estrogen. But what does one need to be aware of for symptoms? Yeah, yeah, that's actually interesting. Um, you know, the I'm not sure where exactly the question is going, but I'll go with it anyway. Um, my daughter actually sent me a, a graphic looking at the risk of clotting complications with different therapies. And, and one of the things in there was birth control, right? Birth control um, can actually increase a, a woman's uh, risk of having uh, clotting issues. Um, we definitely strongly recommend women on oral contraceptive pills do not smoke. Um, smoking is another issue. Um, you know, if we're concerned here about the J&J &J complications, I will be reassuring. You know, we're, we're looking at this being um, less than the risk of getting struck by lightning, um, certainly much safer than driving to and from a vaccine appointment. Um, but everyone, it looks like, either acutely came in with, with a severe headache or soon thereafter developed headache. Um, so we're advising people after the J&J &J vaccine across the board, um, if you develop a severe headache, um, if you have trouble breathing, um, if you have abdominal pain, 
um, then get evaluated. And uh, we can actually do blood work. We can we can sort out whether or not this is a significant concern. I know we had a, a ton of individuals, the ERs, over the last uh, couple days, um, you know, worried about these issues. Um, but again, this is very rare. So I really want to reinforce that. Um, there's no recommended treatment um, at this point. We're not recommending putting amboron on aspirin or anticoagulation. With an event as rare as this seems to be, um, we're more likely to do harm than than anything beneficial. All right. Mary writes, in a recent clinical update, you said if a school plan results in lots of potential exposure, then the plan is not a good one. The school needs a better plan. I'm a high school teacher. We have been doing cohorted hybrid days since September. We're being forced to come back full in person after a few weeks, in a few weeks. Instead of 12 kids in a room with six foot distancing, we'll now have 25 to 28 kids in a room with three foot. The CDC guidelines say anyone within six feet for more than 15 minutes would be considered a close contact, would have to quarantine. In that case, a single positive student in six classes throughout the day could yield as many as 36 contacts in the building. Given the limitations of space in our building and the CDC guidelines on close contacts, I don't see how there could be a return to a school plan that does not result in a lot of potential exposures. Do you have any advice on this? This is an excellent question, and I think hits right on um, what I talked about. And a lot of parents had this as a disconnect. You just told me that if the children are three feet apart and wearing masks, that is not that is not a risky behavior. But yet you're telling me that if the kids are three feet apart and someone has COVID, if they're both wearing masks, it doesn't matter. It's an exposure. So there really is a disconnect here. Um, so I know some local health departments have worked with the school and said, no, this this doesn't make any sense. Um, but this is you know, sort of reaching out to the CDC. Um, we, we, we need this guidance on a national level. Um, I think it's great now that the CDC is here. Um, you know, sort of back giving us really helpful guidance. And I think it's it's just a matter of getting the guidance updated to be consistent with what we now know. Um, mask wearing can be successfully enforced in the schools. If the kids are wearing masks, um, if you as a teacher and the kids are wearing a mask and you're keeping this uh, separation, um, this is a very low risk activity. Um, also go and get vaccinated, right? That's that's one of the biggest things we can do here. Um, and if you look at our high schools, um, a chunk of the kids, right, are 16, 17. Um, so um, the more people you get vaccinated, the better good ventilation systems. Three feet is going to give you that 80% reduction. You throw a mask on either side of that three feet. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I think your math is exactly what I worry about. Um, you know, one child, six different periods, every time they're sitting surrounded by eight kids. Next thing you know, everyone's in quarantine. Uh, we were only in school for a day. All right. One more from Ellen, who talks about the uh, discussion we had about pulling back on the I am injection for the vaccine. And she has a question, which is, what might be the consequences of inadvertent IV administration of the vaccine? Someone I know came to me with a concern that one of the vaccines he gave did in fact go IV, which he believes based on feel of having hit a vessel, by, followed by continuing to inject before his brain and muscles had time to react to this unexpected sensation. I realize there's no data, but would appreciate thoughts on what would be theoretically expected in this case. The vaccine in question was mRNA, but uh, I suppose in either case, we would have the recipe for spike protein, as I call it, within circulation. Would this lead to uptake and spike production within the vessels? If so, could this be related to rare clotting issues seen with AZ and now J&J? &J? And would it move out of the bloodstream and be used in a similar but less localized way than in IM? Uh, your insight, as always, much appreciated. Yes, I am. I am speculating here, but I, I will share like what my experience. So, um, you know, I was doing a lot of vaccines this last week. We did over three hundred last week. We actually did over a hundred J and J just Friday, right before the uh, the pause was triggered. And um, you know, I I always ask the people before I give them a shot. I say, "Oh, are you a bleeder?" And uh, one of my one of my partners, Nuja Lee, who I mentioned earlier, she was like, well, "Why do you do that?" And some people, you give them a shot and they bleed. The majority of the people we are giving these shots to, when you're done, they don't even need a Band-Aid. They're fine. But a certain percent of them will bleed. Sometimes it prompts them to let, let me know that they're on a blood thinner or something like that. Um, but sometimes you do the shot and actually they really start bleeding and you have to apply pressure and put a Band-Aid, which is not consistent with this concept that we have been told that the deltoid, there's there's no blood vessels there. It's very small capillaries. Um, there There is some vascularity to a deltoid. Um, particularly in someone who's maybe more active, et cetera. Um, 
so I don't I don't think we're quite clear on what's what's going on here. Um, you know, it's significant bleeding sometimes in some of these individuals, suggesting a larger vessel than um, you know we've sort of been led to believe when we talk about the pulling back the plunger. But let's move on to the next level. Um, the issues that we're seeing do not appear to be that the vaccine is necessarily in the in the blood system. What we're actually seeing is an immune response. We're seeing six to 13 days later. We're seeing antibody production. Um, these antibodies are against a certain target, um, PF4, so platelet factor four. Um, I don't necessarily think um, getting in the circulation explains it. If anything, a, a good, robust immune response is what explains this. So um, I understand the concept of pulling back on the plunger, um, but I'm not sure I would understand the mechanism. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 58 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thanks again, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone, be safe.